Welcome to the Probate Mastermind Podcast. These episodes are recorded live once a week and are hosted by the AllTheLeads.com coaches. Agents, investors, and wholesalers join the coaches for everything from marketing tips, sales psychology, life deal analysis, transaction engineering, advanced real estate strategy, and personal development. You will learn to get more listings, more deals, and find financial freedom by listening to these episodes. Be sure to catch show notes at AllTheLeads.com slash podcast and join our free Facebook Mastermind community, All The Leads Mastermind. Welcome to our incredible agents and investors from across the country. Today is Thursday, January 7th, and this is uh, Mastermind Podcast number 309. Aaron Bevins, if you're on the call, just hit star six and hit one. We had one of our long-term subscribers wanted to give us a great success story. Uh, In the meantime, we do have two people in the queue. We've got plenty of room for more, guys. Please uh, don't be shy. I know we took a couple weeks off, but uh, hopefully you all were working and you have some challenges, some success stories, some ways that we can help you. So we do have three in the queue now. That's great. So let's go ahead and go to our first caller. First up this week is phone number ending in 4428. You're up first. Hey, this is uh, Tim. Just have a quick question. I'm relatively new. I, I started sending out my series of three letters and following them up with phone calls. I was just curious, do many people, what, what's the experience of folks in terms of getting calls from the letters versus the outbound calls that you make, success one versus the other? Yeah, great question. Tim, do you have any stati- I will tell you that it's a one-two combination. If you do one without the other, you're not going to get as good a result. The letter is an icebreaker, so it's less of a cold call when you pick up the phone, but I think even the best marketers will tell you if you get a 2 to 5% response rate on an unsolicited letter, you're probably doing well. But the combination of sending that letter and following up with the phone call is what works. And I will tell you, we do have people in less competitive markets that don't even pick up the phone. They do extremely well with, with the mail. But if you're in a competitive market, there probably are other realtors and investors that are sending them letters. We try to help you make yours distinctive enough that it'll stand out, but you do have to follow up with a phone call. Bruce and Tim, anything you want to add to that? Please. I have I have a pretty lengthy answer, unfortunately, but no, um, fine. Might be, this is going to be a good opportunity for a lot of people to pick up some knowledge on mail and calls, specifically the combination. As Jim mentioned, it does depend on the market that you're in and how competitive it is. In my market, I, I have to do pretty much six mailings minimum, three, and people aren't quite ready to to make a decision, and then they have about three months to forget who I am if I, ended it, if I end my mail and call sequence at three. And it's also competitive, so there's a lot of mailbox noise. In my market, if I were only going to do letters and no calls, I might convert a half a percent on my list, whereas the combination is the most powerful thing. So what ends up happening in a lot of markets, the more rural, less competitive markets are definitely an exception to this, but a lot of markets, the people that have not answered your calls for several months, around month four, they start to pick the phone up and they start to say something like this. They start to say, hey, Tim, I didn't mean to, to have been to have not responded to your last couple of voicemails. I have been getting your letters and voicemails, and I've been meaning to call you. And that's what a lot of people are hearing is month four, I've been meaning to call you. Now, I don't know if those people ever would have called had you not called them. But at least you can get that kind of foundation of a conversation started where if they say that, it's a pretty easy conversion at that point. You just simply say, hey, what were you going to call me about? And, and just let them talk, and usually it turns into an appointment. But I don't find that conversation happens for about four months. The, okay. the people that are going to answer, people basically fall into one of two categories. They either answer an unknown number or they don't answer an unknown number. I happen to be in the latter. I don't typically answer unknown numbers. I don't either. So for me, I'm going to need to hear from you for several months before you build up credibility and the other thing is your competition, they're all pretty much dropping out of they're dropping out of the, the marketing and prospecting cycle around that second or third month. So extending that a few extra months is going to give you time without competition while that family's deciding on what to do with real estate. Okay. 
What, in terms of the leads that I'm getting your leads, and you know, I'm looking at the dates of death and the dates that the probate was filed, what is, is there an ideal time to, sometimes I worry that calling too early is too fresh and too, too emotional. What's the best time frame to defer from the date of death to, to start making calls? I'll, I'll start with that, if you don't mind, Bruce. I, it's Go funny, ahead. the biggest complaint that or concern that I hear I originally, the first three, four years of this company, I was the sales team. and We hired a great team of people. And the biggest concern I used to hear was, oh, I don't want to be an ambulance chaser. I don't want to bother people right after they had a loss in the family. And what I always reminded people, on average, it's somewhere between three and four months. I think it's an average of about three and a half to four months between the date of death and the family filing the probate. Chances are by the time they hire an attorney, they go down, they file the, the probate, they do the paperwork necessary, they're, they're still maybe grieving, but they're probably past the grief enough that they've made the business decision that they need to deal with this. So it's certainly not like you're seeing a death notice in the paper and you're calling them a few days later. So it in all the time I was doing this, I never had anybody call me that ambulance chaser. I know we've had half a dozen people say it happens, but it's like getting struck by lightning. It's probably the exception to the rule. Would you agree with that, Bruce? Oh, I completely agree. I think that most people aren't going to be that upset. A lot of it depends on your approach on the phone. If you call and say, hey, I, I literally had this happen. I had a, a competing agent that I knew, and one of his neighbors died, and he walked across the street during the wake. During the wake, knocked on the door, family member comes to the door and he said, I guess you're going to be needing me soon. And he handed his business card. Now, none of us would do, none of, the, none of us on this call would do that. But there are techniques on the phone that are a little bit more abrasive than others that you probably want to avoid. That, hey, I'm calling to see if you want to sell the house immediately. But if you call and you can summarize what you do and that I, I have a local service that really concentrates on helping family members who've recently lost someone navigate through the tough process of probate. And listen, I don't know if what I'm offering is going to benefit you or not. Could we talk for maybe 30 seconds and let you decide if, if it's worth a further conversation? I don't know anyone that would get mad at that. I've never had anyone yeah. get mad at that. So a lot of it depends on your approach. If you come very empathetically and talk about a service that helps family members who who are going through a tough time navigate through this, why are they going to get upset even if it's only been two weeks since? Okay. Yeah, concern yeah. probably is unfounded, yes, on my part. Yeah, let me add one other thing to what Bruce said because he's right on the money. This is Tim. The other thing I would add is that when you mail out and you're doing it over a two, three-month period and you're starting that process, you're making the assumption, as Bruce said, they're, they're maybe holding on to one or more of your letters, or they might toss it the first time it comes in, and maybe the second time they look at it and go, oh, I've seen that before. And we all unconsciously respond to some subliminal things that come out. So they're going to eventually, if they don't do it the very first time, and we do a really good job of making sure that we get great open rates, and it's all anecdotal because we hear about that. And there are people literally who get calls from their first mailing and they get listings or they're able to purchase property from their very first mailing. And it definitely happens. And we hear about it every month. Somebody often calls in and says, I couldn't believe it. I sent my first letters out. We heard somebody last week, two, two opportunities in their first mailing. We got a, a letter from a customer and they were so excited. But more importantly, the other thing you might want to consider doing is in one of your mailings, include a trifold brochure that talks a little bit more. You can do a good bit more with it. It also gives the mailing itself a little bit more volume in terms of the size of the envelope. And it, the more oomph there is inside that, the more often it's going to get open. And we, we work closely with the Postal Service so we know how thick we can make it without getting over the cost numbers where it doesn't drive the cost out of the stratosphere to get that done. So if you haven't considered getting a trifold and you're getting serious about mailing, that's something you ought to talk to uh, our team about, and they'll help you put something like that together as well. Then they've got that brochure to look at as well as your letter, and they know you're serious. They know you're not just trying to hustle them. Okay. That's great. Awesome. And, Tim, we haven't talked about the trifold brochure recently. We're getting off your original question, but you can also use that trifold right. to go up, well, to 
to go out and get some attorney business. Say to an attorney, I know you're not allowed to market. We, I, out of the probate leads I get every month, probably 25% of them don't have an attorney. Would you know? Would you mind if I said, hey, if you're looking for a good attorney, and put his name on there and make it a re- reciprocal agreement? If I'm going to do that, would you please keep me in mind? And you don't want to do this with every attorney, but see who the player is in your market and go out and pitch him on on referring business back and forth. And you can use that trifold to do that. We've had a number of agents that have been very successful doing it that way. So and the attorney, yeah. Just- yeah. It's true, and I, now I'm taking us even further down this. We're not only talking about attorneys. We have team members that work closely with us in our local markets, like contractors, financial advisors, handymen, insurance agents. They could also go into brochures and onto letters, and a lot of times, if they're getting any kind of return at all, a lot of times they're willing to help us offset the cost of our mail. So I'll go to take a financial advisor, for example, and I'll say, look, I'd like to give you a testimonial, brag you up. I'm pursuing leads like this, and a lot of them are inheriting money and need to know what to do with it. Can I can I put you on my brochure? Can I put a card inside of my mailing? And either you can say, if it works, help me offset the cost of that mailing, or you can say, and this is a this is key for my attorney relationship, so I go to the financial advisor and offer to do that, and then I'll say, I don't want anything in return. All I'm going to ask for is that the best financial or estate planning attorney or two that would you introduce me. That's how I get a lot of my attorney introductions from the financial advisors that are referring them every day. And then I offer the advisor something of value and ask for an attorney introduction in return. But there's ways to, to use putting people's information in these brochures and into your mail to either offset your mail or leverage those for other connections that you need. That's great. Okay. That's great. All right. Excellent. We hope that helps. Any other questions, Tim? No, we're good. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. Great question. And it led to uh, a lot of good conversation. We have three more in the queue, guys. We do have plenty of room for more. Just hit star six and hit one. In the meantime, next up is phone number ending in 363. You're up next. Good afternoon. Good My afternoon, Barbara. Barbara. How are you? Fine. Happy New Year. Hey, the question. my question has to deal with when you're cold calling, I, I have been sending out the first and second letters, and I, I get I feel a little awkward when I'm calling about the spouse because I don't know as to whether or not they're planning on staying in the house or if they're planning on selling it. And in most situations that I've come across, they've said that they're not doing anything. Is there something that I can say other than the fact that I've noticed that their spouse is deceased? Sure. And, Tim, you want to go first uh, on this one? Go ahead. Or, do you, or I don't know, Tim. I, I meant Bruce. I'm sorry. Or Tim, did, Tim, did you have a comment? Yeah. Or Okay, Bruce, go ahead. Go ahead. So the if you lead in with empathy and you let people know, as I kind of mentioned to Tim on the the last caller, that you let them know that you have a service that specifically helps families go through the the waters, navigate the waters of probate. And and, and then what I do is I let that lead me into my elevator pitch, which is essentially where I hit anything from repairs and maintenance to personal property. I keep it relatively short. And what I'll do is – just turn the conversation over to them. If they say, hey, no, we have everything handled, we're not doing anything, I know that I've been empathetic, and I'll just use that to ask my real estate question after validating them. One of one of the biggest things that we need to know when we are uh, prospecting is when somebody hits you with an objection and you handle it, because we all want to handle objections. We all want to handle the resistance that they give us. By handling their resistance, all a lot of times we're really proving is that we're a better arguer than they are. We don't always win the argument. So if they hit me with resistance, I will go about validating their objection or their resistance before I'll try to handle it. So you validate. You say, hey, I completely understand. I'm glad to hear you have everything handled. I'm glad to hear that you're not doing this or not doing that. Let me give you my name and number, and that way you have a way to call me. And then 
you let you flip after giving the the validation you flip over and say and if you don't mind my asking do you guys know what you were going to do with the real estate or if you are you is that still in limbo okay so i'll pretend like they weren't even objecting to the real estate sale okay. i'll okay. circle back around and re-ask that again okay and barbara I, chad is not here today he always quotes a statistic and i think it's something like 82 percent of all americans plan on dying in their home but less than 12 percent do so that yeah. surviving spouse it may have really good intentions but especially if it's a widow chad always tells a story or two too from his own business where no way i'm gonna i'm gonna die here i, I don't need anything and he said well, not a problem there may be things that come up and remember they it might be her first winter in the home she might not be up for the maintenance the upkeep and anyway he had one like that he left a brochure and then just months later the surviving spouse had a stroke, and their family members found the brochure pinned up in the refrigerator and said, come out and list the house. So that's one you want to treat more like a long-term lead. Okay. But just okay. adopt them. In, oh, you're welcome. Adopt them into your sphere of influence and just okay. treat them like a past clients or a sphere and keep in touch and see how you can okay. help them. All right. Appreciate it. And, Tim, I, Tim, we lost. Go ahead, Barbie. Did you have another question? Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, I just sent some letters out from December, got a call this week from a gentleman who said that I was the only one that had sent him a letter. He was struck by my professionalism. He really liked the letter a lot. And I, I can't help feeling, too, that the fact that I handwrite all the envelopes because I, I feel that people are going to open that more often than if it's a label or whatever. And I'm I'm getting there. Good, good. You definitely are. I remember from day one when I spoke to you, you've always had a great attitude. And it's it's a process, and you're following the process. Yeah. Keep up the great work and go get that listed. Come back and let us know. And then, okay. Tim, I think we lost you for a minute, Tim. You had a comment also, correct? Yeah, yeah. And that was from the previous call, but I'll actually comment on what she just said as well. It's important to realize that when we do the mailings for you, we don't use labels, and we have written our own specific software that not only uses custom fonts that we've created to do what we do to print the letters, but they don't look like everybody sends letters out. You can get them all the time in the mail that have a script font on them, and they look crappy, and nobody wrote those. But we have not only use our own handwriting fonts, we actually form each letter differently than the rest of them on there. We print them at a sort of a skewed, warped angle. They definitely appear handwritten, and the same thing with anything that we put on them. If it's designed to look like it was written by hand, ours look written by hand, and they're indecipherable from being that way. And we're really proud of what we do with that. So if you're doing one or two of them, and you may not want to, you may not want to have us do it. But we have customers literally who, and, and that's the one thing you got to realize: we we are willing to do this as a short run. We're here to help you. We've got customers who do one and two letters. A month after their third month, they work their list down, and they may have started with 50, and by the end of the third month, they're only working a couple of people, and we mail those out for them, and so they'll start with 50, whittle it down to 20, whittle it down to 10, whittle it down to 5, whittle it down to 2, and we still do it for them, and we've got several customers that do that, and we love that because it's already in the system, relatively easy for us to do. We get to know you well. It gets customized specifically for you, so... We're happy to work with you, and you won't find anybody else that's willing to work with you at that level and do those kinds of short runs for for the silly prices that we're willing to do them for. Thank you so much. I'm glad you're there. Thank you, Barbara. And then, Tim, you had a, previ a comment on the previous caller also, you said? No, I, I'd already done that, but that was that okay. when I said it before. We're good. Got it. All right, great. Next up is phone number ending in 7583. You're up next. Hey, how you doing, guys? My name is Cornelius. i kind of been on the sidelines for about about six months now, just um, listening to you guys' podcast, so I got two quick questions. The first question I would be, with a person with a limited budget to really dive in and invest, what would be the best strategies you would um, suggest to be other than cold calling? Because I'm doing that now, and my conversion rates are not really high. Well, I really haven't got a deal yet, but that's one. And then my second question would be, I'm in Virginia, and I had an issue with a client to where 
the, she had siblings, and the siblings wasn't on listed as a fiduciary. But when it was time to sell the house, the siblings wanted to sue her. And when I went downtown the courthouse to ask the question, to be like, hey, how is this possible? They said because they're related. So I was really confused about that part, even though they're not listed and they haven't been paying any of the taxes or anything on the house as well. Sure. And, Bruce, you may have a take on this, but it's like if there's a will, the family members can still contest the will. Maybe only one person was the executor and was appointed the executor, but and they have control, but that doesn't mean that the family members can't petition or contest or try to get the executor overturned. And I, that's one of the reasons we always tell you, ask on the first conversation, even if there's one person who's totally in charge, just ask, are there any other family members that are going to be involved or receive the proceeds? And try to include them in the conversation up front, if in fact there are. And you have anything to add to that, Bruce? Another way to ask that is to make a statement and let somebody correct you, because a lot of times, especially if somebody doesn't know us yet, they might not be wanting to answer a ton of questions. So if you're running into people that are hesitant to give you the information on the brother and sister that might sue them later, maybe you just say, I assume you don't have any other siblings that want a piece of this, do you? Okay, so you're making a, a statement, and and then if you're wrong, they'll correct you. It's a great way to gather information. I would, I've run into a couple of situations where a will was contested, or one time a family member wrote, signed two wills, and, and so the judge honored the uh, last will that was written. So sometimes you just run into cases like that. What I would do is I'd probably just say, hey, do you have the contact information for your siblings? I'm, I'm happy to try to step in and act as a little unbiased intermediary and see if I can bring you guys together. And if I can't, I can connect you with someone that can. You getting on the phone with them is important, I believe. Okay. The, the You guys might have some, some more answer on that particular issue, but I want to go to the first question that you asked about for someone that's on a limited budget. Other than cold calling, what can you do? I'm going to be a, a smart ass and say, other than cold calling, you can always cold call a little bit more. I hate to say that, but you can door, you can door knock. You could always go door knock. But if you're operating on a really tight budget, I, I just make sure that I'm hitting the phones. I'm talking to people very respectfully and trying to identify uh, first those whether someone is low-hanging fruit or high-hanging fruit. In other words, are they thinking about eventually selling or do they need to do something now? And if you can whittle each list down by identifying who you might work with in the future and who you're not going to work with, maybe you could do like a handwritten personal note for cheap to the handful of people that say, hey, we're probably going to eventually sell. That's a way to mail without breaking the bank. You're only mailing to the people that have told you, yeah, we're going to sell, and it's more of a follow-up. Otherwise, marketing costs a little bit of money, and if you're not going to market, you just need to spend that time prospecting on the phone. And I, I would just add to that, like we we told the earlier caller, if you're in a competitive market, send out five, six, seven, eight mailings. If you're not getting immediate responses or having good conversations, if you're only going to call, be the most proficient caller out there. Call these people for four, five, six, seven, eight months until you disqualify them. I would just call everybody at least once a month, maybe every other week, until they say, oh, no, I'm never going to do any business with you. Because it, it, it reminds me when I was an active agent, the day a FISBO came on the market or the day it expired, they'd have 100 contacts, 100 calls. But a couple months later, I was still calling them, and I was you know, maybe 80% of them were gone. But the 20% that remained, I was the only person still contacting them. So just be the most dogged, most persistent caller, and just be really good with your lead follow-up, and, and eventually you'll you'll have some wins. Make sense? Sir, still there? You so All right. You're very welcome. We have three more in the queue, guys. We still have time for more. Just hit star six and hit one. Meantime, next up is phone number ending in 3215. You're up next. Hey, this is Dana from uh, Texas. Doing great, Dana. How about you, buddy? Good, good. I have not received my first list yet, so I am uh, okay. trying to be a little proactive. And, uh, of course, wandering around in the website and looking at all of these cool letters that we uh, have going. So I'm assuming that on my first phone call, somebody's going to help me pick my letters. Am I thinking that right? Uh, yes. yes. I'm, go ahead. I'll let you guys answer that. Go ahead. Yes, that's a true statement. We have 
implementation specialists that are here to help you do that, help you get your website set up, help you do anything that you need to go do and get you all fixed up. And we make sure that it does what you need to go do and tell you how to edit them and deal with all the pieces of that. So whenever you're ready to do that, just let us know and we'll do that. And if you want, I can simply have Michaela reach out to you after the call today and she'll start right up with you. I think I have I have one call set up and then the next one was pushed way far out. But I've got those things cooking. Another question I've got is that in our local town, we have a kind of a senior community senior, let's take care of seniors, basically. And this group, I would think, would be a good place maybe to put some marketing in there to let them know that I help people handle what happens at the end of life. It, does that seem like a good, reasonable expenditure, or should I just continue using the leads and not worry about that? Bruce? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that's something that you should work on. A project like that, I can, I'll can i look at something like that and consider it one of my 90-day sprints. I, I always try to keep a handful of, of things like you just described as like a 90-day push where I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work really hard to build that that relationship and that that marketing over 90 days. If that's the next thing that you do, great. But but I think your letters and your and perfecting your phone call dialogue is probably the most important thing for now. And if you have a really good dialogue and you're steady on the phone, that you're consistent and your letters are done, by all means go after it. But don't chase okay. that in place of it, a lot of people will chase a project like that because it seems like it's easier business. It's not. The easier business is hitting your list. Right. And then okay. if you have time for a 90-day sprint with that end-of-life facility, go for it. Okay. All right. One more thing here. I have not – just in letting people know that I'm doing this, I've had a couple of attorneys that have been interested in hearing from me. I have put off – their conversations because I didn't really feel like I knew enough to uh, be dangerous except to myself. But I was considering my team insofar as having all of those people in place, the movers and the uh, estate plant, uh, the estate sale and all that stuff. Is that something while I'm waiting on my list that I should go ahead and try to get into place? Yes, absolutely. Get those in place. You should always be working on your team from day one through day 2000 be working on your team with regard to the kind of the precursor to that question the attorneys don't mm -hmm. feel like you're to don't feel like you don't have enough knowledge and that you don't have your system down the attorneys for the most part and I think all of us have egos but attorneys have pretty big ego and the more you go into an attorney relationship telling them how you benefit them the the less likely I've found they are to necessarily like you. So a lot of times what I'll do with an attorney is I'll go in and say, hey, you know what I'm thinking? I'm, I'm putting together a program and it looks like this. I could really use your help because I, I think that this would benefit you and I think this would benefit your clients, but I'm not sure. What do you, what do you, what, and can you think of anything else that I should do to make your clients and maybe your life even a little bit easier? And so I'm asking them to help me build it. I'm six years into working probate, and I still meet with attorneys, and this is the approach I take. I don't go in. I'm the probate expert. I go in that they're the probate expert, and they're doing me a favor helping me build something that's going to serve them better, and they love it. And it takes the pressure off of me having to be in pitch mode all the time and giving a perfect presentation. I almost never present, and the attorneys just eat it up because they already really are the legal experts in probate. We're not. Well, that's golden We're advice, and I would also, together. yeah, mm -hmm. great advice. And I, I would also remind you that you, I promise you, more about real estate than they do. We don't be intimidated <laughs> that they know more about the law because that's what they went eight years to college for. <laughs> so mm -hmm. give them credit for their credentials, like Bruce said, and, and then they'll listen. Once you build that relationship, they'll listen to your credentials in real estate. But I 100% agree. Don't lead with that. Great advice. Yeah, and if you want, that, uh, if you that want is a awesome. That is. That's worth the price of the phone call right there. If you well, the phone call was free. I hope it's worth more than that. <laughs> Absolutely. Sorry, Bruce. If you want a tool or resource that you can use uh, to leverage uh, more of that type of conversation, is go create yourself a checklist. Just Google the um, probate process in your state. 
write out a write out a checklist of the probate process. I've created this checklist. I think it might help some of the people that I'm working with. And if you'll give it a review for me, I'm happy to put your name on it and, and send it to anyone that doesn't have an attorney yet. Now, I know that my checklist is spot on in my state, but I'll intentionally leave a mistake or two on my checklist when I send it to an attorney because I want them to, to see something and call me back and say, hey, I think you need to do this. I want them to correct me. Most people love offering you insight and correction and direction, clarification. They like that. Create a checklist for yourself. It could just be a single page or two pages like mine. Send it. Just say, hey, if I sent this to you, would you review it? I'll, I'm happy to send it out to my clients or my leads that don't have an attorney. Wow, that is awesome. That is super, super awesome, and it just gives me more more food to to chew on, and it gives me a greater sense of excitement. I'm looking forward to getting into this. This is very good. Thanks for the uh, input, and I look forward to hearing the rest of the call. That is awesome. And for those of you in line, forgive the – I'm going to let somebody jump ahead of you. I My office just told me that, Aaron, you were having trouble getting in, so I'm going to unmute you now. Aaron, is this you on phone number 1296? That is me. How are you doing, my friend? <laughs> Do it great. Little background, guys. Aaron and his dad have been with us for how long? A couple years now? Or has it been that long? It's been two years. Yes, sir. Two years, never hear from or rarely hear from them. They just go out there, do their own thing, and then your dad let it drop just casually that probates are bread and butter. It's the best source of business we have. So I said, yeah. you got to have Aaron come on the call and just tell us a little story. Tell us how you're using it, what's working for you, Aaron, please. Sure, sure. So we hail out of San Antonio, Texas, and hopping into – and we primarily wholesale real estate. That That's what we do. I, I don't have a license. I've never owned a business before. We just had this. We saw a YouTube video of somebody talking about selling contracts and how it was legal. We did research on it, and we just fell in love with the concept. And then, then my dad found this little company called All the Leads, and he said, you got to hop on this call. That was two years ago. We did. We loved the energy. We loved how you all guys serve. And so we got our first couple lists. I want to say the first few lists, nothing came out of it, and so we were a little discouraged, but... If for nothing else, pride and, and belief in the company, we we just kept getting lists and even added lists surrounding surrounding cities here in San Antonio, and and it was almost like the floodgates of heaven opened up after like month three or four. And first year, I want to say we we did about six figures just in in probate, and that was 2018, and that was only the last few months. I, I want to say last four to six months of 2018. 2019 was our first full year. We did half a million gross profit and assignment fees using all the leads. And, and since then, we've, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pretend like it's been peaches and cream. Like I said, I'm a new business owner, lost a whole bunch of money in switching it up. And I got into triple net leases and the, we got too big for our britches and ended up getting in a whole lot of trouble, lost a whole lot of money going into 2020 um, and then coronavirus and all that fun stuff. But uh, all the leads have been uh, a source of our bread and butter. And we're just excited that we've aligned with you guys and that we've we've come into contact with you. And you learned your lesson. If something works, stick with it. You're back to stay. Right? <laughs> that's exactly. what your dad said. That's, yeah. Exactly. That's, exactly. I'm not getting well, too big for my britches anymore. Yeah. A few things that are great about that is we do have a lot of wholesalers, a lot of wannabe wholesalers, and we don't get as many success stories from them as we do realtors and investors. So that's one reason I wanted you to come on, Aaron. And I definitely want to be in your show. Sorry about the miscommunication, but let's schedule that as, as soon as possible. Aaron does a very successful podcast and tens of thousands of people, I, I think, from what you told me. And if you want to pitch your podcast, go ahead and mention it, Aaron, while you're on the call. Sure. So we have a, a community that, I'm sorry, what's that? No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, go ahead and, and tell the people how they can get on your podcast. Sure, sure. So we have a community that, that we started at the beginning of 2020 called the Superhuman Wholesalers. And uh, the whole concept <laughs> behind it was uh, alone, alone, we, we tend to feel lonely, uh, go figure. And we can <laughs> sometimes sometimes just discourage that this business is super, this business is super discouraging and when you're alone, if you're not, if you don't guard your spirit. So the idea behind the community is what if we can get together, get a whole bunch of people together who are of like mind and, and it be like a bunch of lonely, crazy entrepreneurs 
come together to support <laughs> each other. And, and, and that's what the Superhuman whole and, and the objective of it was to help as many people as possible hit their first six figures wholesaling real estate and, and do it for free and just to have a community. And the group is located on, on Facebook. It's, it's called Superhuman Wholesalers. And the, the core of that group, each week there is uh, a show that we do, and it's called Real Estate of Mine. And we interview uh, successful wholesalers and on, real estate entrepreneurs, and, and they just drop a whole lot of value, techniques, methods, strategies, philosophies, approaches to business that can help you take it to the next level. And we don't charge for it. It's just something free. And here's a confession. Uh, the confession is, is lonely so starting the community was so that i have a whole bunch of friends around me and i could never be lonely and discourage the business <laughs> facebook friends though <laughs> exactly not, not to mention whenever you have a community of people around you who are doing the same thing as you then you have a yeah. whole bunch of deals that are constantly hitting your desk and, and you can work with people and make a lot of money that way hey i thank you so much for contributing i'm sure you inspired some people i'm hope well, that's what we have here a community of people and we're really glad you're back bruce any questions for aaron we do have a pretty full queue but i really appreciate yeah. You're coming fast. on today, Aaron. Yeah. Real fast, Aaron. Do you know, as a wholesaler, because I'm an investor and an agent, and a lot of our subscribers are investors and agents and, and some wholesalers, but as a wholesaler, you get a, a list. What's your expected pipeline conversion rate? So how long do you think that list is going to take to produce your the highest value? So that's a really good question. So I don't have the I don't have the metrics right off the top. And the reason why is because, to be honest, after that massive L that we took in 2020, we did hold off on our list for a while. We went from on top of the world, more money than we've ever made in our whole life, to like losing more money than we've ever you know, lost in our whole life. We're now regulating all of that and, and getting our metrics together. But I'll put it to you like this. In 2019, every other list got us a deal. And every other list yep. got, got us a deal and they were on average our biggest deals and our average deal in 2019 was 15,000. Our average probate deal was like 23,000, something crazy like that. One of the awesome. one of the I want to say the first one that we got was like a 17,000. Then my partner Annalise uh, her first deal was, was off a probate list. That was a $30,000 deal. Then then a couple of 15, 16, 20s. But yeah, our, our average in 20, 2019 was about 23000 per deal. And it was about every other list that, that we got. Great. Awesome. Well, that's great. Yeah. That is great. Yeah. Let's get together as soon as possible. And guys, please, if you cat, – Cat will put some notes for your podcast attached to the broadcast for this show. And let's uh, get together, and I'd be glad to be on your show. I'm sorry we had some confusion the other night, Aaron. And thank you so much. I think you inspired a lot of people today. I appreciate you coming. No no worries. My pleasure. And, and I look forward to being on these calls just to, to listen and, and get some of the gems in the future. So thank you all for having me. Welcome back. All right, let's power through the last four people in the queue. Next up is phone number ending in 2517. You're up next. Hey, this is Sue, and I just went through your probate, the last probate class, and I've met with Bruce, and I'm maybe just information overload, but I have two simple, I think, questions. One is trespassing signs, if you're talking to them about a, a vacant property, is that the, how does that work though? That if somebody squats on the property and there's no trespassing signs, how long does it take to evict them? Yeah, every state is different, and we don't pretend to be attorneys. But if it, I guess the analogy I would give, if you go to a rest, if you go to a business or a restaurant, and leave your car there for any length of time, they usually have 90 minutes only, customers only, violators will be towed away. It's the same type of thing. It's it gives them the illegal ability to tow away your car sooner than have and to track it down, find out who it is, and go through the legal process. In most states, having sufficient notice precludes any kind of an objection or a, a precludes a person from saying, I'm a tenant, I have a tenant-landlord relationship, I'm a squatter, I've been here for this length of time, I have a right to be here. And it's going to vary from state to state, but it in some places, you can just call the police, and I have my place posted, no trespassing, and they'll come out and evict the people away. I assume in other states it may take a little bit of time, but it's always going to be, almost always going to be quicker than having to formally evict them. Anything you want to add to that, Bruce? I, I'm not sure if I have a good yeah, understanding. You did, but Yeah, you exactly what I was going to say. Okay. 
Perfect. And what's your second question? And is the probate, like the timeline, is that from state to state different, like for how many months they'll wait to make sure there's no claims against the property? 100% it is. But in virtually every state, there's a process for carving the real estate out and going ahead and selling and closing on it prior to the probate being completed. Yeah, in Florida, you just have to go before the judge and it's a hearing and and they do that and then the proceeds go into escrow. The seller doesn't get them until the probate's completed, but it allows you and the sellers to get the property sold quicker. And I I don't think there's any states that don't provide that. I know the vast majority of them do. And that's a good conversation with the first time you do a deal, good excuse or good reason to call the attorney and just ask him is how long do you think this will take and can we petition the court to to be able to close sooner? And again, that's a valuable thing that you can mention to the seller because most sellers aren't aware of it. And believe it or not, even in California, like with full authority, a lot of attorneys don't mention it either. I think it just complicates their job. So that's a good value you can bring. And it would probably just start with a conversation with the probate attorney. Okay. How long it takes to, to how long it takes to actually close and settle probate is almost, in, in the majority of cases, irrelevant to us. Because the family right. could leave probate open for years and years. It doesn't mean that we can't list and sell or buy the house. So let them close probate on there and their attorney's time frame. And then we help them clean the house out, do the repairs, maintenance, and get the deal. Okay, very good. Thank you. All right, perfect. Let's see. Next up is, I think it's Kathy, phone number ending in 3040. Hi, good afternoon. I'm calling because last fall I, I ended up getting three deals, like bang, and I closed them between September and November. And now, of course, I'm not getting anything, and I thought maybe it was a holiday. But I got to thinking because I, I want to show that I am an asset or I'm valuable. So I was thinking about offering them a a broker's price opinion, and I wanted to know what your thought was on doing that. Sure. I think that's a little, it's certainly something to keep in your arsenal. It's a little okay. gimmicky in that in that I, I don't think many people are going to take it if you offer it inside of a letter. That I've tried offering probate checklists and vendor lists and yeah. broker price opinions and all kinds of things in my letters, and, and it's just yeah. rare that they get taken up on, but do hold that in okay. your arsenal and then... Basically, you just say, hey, would it be beneficial if I was if I gave you a free broker's price opinion so you knew what you were dealing with in the future? They say yes, and you say, could I meet you at the house next week? But not, I wouldn't say in the letter because it, it's rare that someone's going to actually want that. Okay. okay. All right. Great. I'll do that. Now, I, I have a, a CRM, my own CRM, through my realtor that I'm using. So I put a lot of my leads in there. And I build a campaign, and I've been sending them out like every 14 days because I'm having a lot of trouble getting people on the phone and anyone responding to me. And I thought, inundate them with information. Maybe they'll see value to it. Is, is that through email or letters? What are you? Uh, what's your medium e- for sending those? Email. Email. Okay. Email is customer service, and it's branding. Uh, branding and customer service take a long time to convert. So your letters going out pretty consistently, and you consistently leaving voicemails. Uh, so I expect about 15 to 20 percent of any list to be the type of person that's going to answer the phone, and about 80 to 85 percent that won't be the type of person to answer the phone, and wow. uh, an unknown number. So when I'm calling the first month. I'm pretty much getting my 15%, and then I think my follow-up calls over the next few months are unlikely to get a ton of answers. But around month three or month four, we will start to answer and say, I've been meaning to call you. So the calls and the letters will go faster than just email. But if you're dripping emails and value through through email and through your CRM, it only helps. I wouldn't expect that to be your conversion, but it does reinforce your brand. Oh, okay. All right. Then I'll, I'll continue that. Okay, the other thing I had the other day, I had a gentleman call me, and he was, he was kind of rude because he said, you've been sending me letters and, and calling me, and I don't think I've been calling him as much as he says I have been. But he says, I, first of all, I don't know who you are, and he, he says, I want to know if you're licensed. So I told him that I'm I'm certified, and I said, I don't need to be licensed, but I am licensed as a real estate uh, agent. And this is just continuing education 
to broaden my scope in order to help people. He didn't like that. He, I don't want to work with anybody who doesn't have a license by the state. Oh, the bottom you're, you're, line licensed is, as a, you're licensed as a real estate agent, correct? Yes. Yes, okay. So that's the license that he was referencing. Don't worry about a probate license through the state. That doesn't exist. Yeah, Your answer to that in the future is yes, yes, I am licensed in North Carolina, yeah. in whatever state you're in, okay? I yeah. am licensed, and this is what I do. I have a service that helps families, okay? You don't know who yeah. I am. What would you like to ask? Okay. The bottom line was he kind of told me, he said, we're, we're just going to follow what our attorney tells us. And then I tried to tell them about how much the attorney does and how much you're supposed to be doing, but he got, kind of got rude, and he just got to the point. He just picked me off your list. I thought, oh, okay, if you're going to be this way, then maybe I don't want to deal with you. Yeah, you can't yeah. get them all. You may yeah. want to wait a couple months and say, hey, you pop back up on my list. You're ready to do something yeah. yet. I, yeah. I wouldn't automatically, the first time somebody tells you no, you take them off the list. Maybe just wait a little bit longer to call them back. You got a comment, Bruce? No, I don't have anything else right now. All right, perfect. Two, three more in the queue, guys. I have, okay, I'm going to try to get to all of you. Next up is phone number ending in 2811. You're up next. Uh, hi, my name is Ross. I'm in New York. Uh, I had a question. If do you have a contract? Because if I run into somebody who wants to buy it, I'm not even sure what. To, I'm a real estate agent in, in, in Queens. I want to know if there's a contract that you guys recommend. Or uh, and the second question was, uh, if I'm paying for cold calling and a letter, and somebody else in New York is doing the same thing, do you cold call for both of us to the same names? That's my two questions. Yeah, to answer your first question, you, you're a realtor. You have a real estate license. Yes. Okay, yeah, you got to get you go, go to your local state association of realtors for the contract because they vary so differently from state to state. And make sure your broker approves whatever contract you're using. But there isn't one that is probate specific. You just may want to add some clauses. What yeah. I do on mine, yeah, what I do on mine, I never put a closing date. I put closing will take place within 30 days of completion of probate or whatever. In case the last one I got ready to flip, there one of the heirs died and it took another four or five months and my contract was still void, still valid. So you'd have to go back and keep getting it extended. And then, forgive me, I forgot the second part of the question. I think I was going to defer it to Bruce. Do you remember what it was, Bruce? Yeah, if we have yeah, more than one subscriber in a county that's doing the, the ISA service and the letters. If we are doing your okay. mail... If we're fulfilling your mail and somebody else in your county has the same letter you want to use, we'll default to, to only sending that particular letter to the first person that, that, that signed up. And that's one of the reasons why we have 25 or 30 letters in the system is just in case somebody else has the same letter. ISA service, correct me if I'm wrong, Jim, I think that we would would call for more than one person in the county. Hey, Jim, you, can you, are you still there, Tim? You want to answer that one? Timothy? And is not there. Go ahead, Bruce. I was just going to say, as much as I, I want to sell our services, is there a reason why you're not calling yourself? Is it time? Well, no, I'm just not really good at cold calling, but uh, what about that? So you think you guys just do the letters? My, do you guys do the letters and I do the calling? Because I only have 150 leads. Uh, so far, I've, I've been for three months, only been 50 leads per month. So far, you so might want to try both 50. for a little bit while you're increasing your skill. But don't just only lean on our our ISAs. So if you are using our ISAs, great, but you should also be calling while you're improving your skills. Okay, just one more question. Do you have a few websites like Objection Heads, words like Objection, if the person says this, say that? I know you're going to make it your own eventually, but for now, if they say, I already have an attorney, and you would have a little rebuttal Objection Head in the sheet, that can go by on the USB, USP. So we don't have an objection handling sheet. I like to validate objections. I mentioned it a little earlier in this call. And then reframe the question a different way or move to a different topic. However, I do have some dialogue that has been recorded at this point. And if you want that dialogue, some sample recordings of how I may go through a probate call, get with me after the call, jump on the uh, training drop down in your portal and schedule a free coaching call and I'm happy to share that with you. And the USP for us is we just have a team basically. That's my last question. USP for us is 
I have a team, a unique selling proposition. That's a pretty good one. So I call that an elevator pitch. A USP is something that personally, and this is semantics, we're all, everyone on this call is going to have a different uh, term, but I, I call that an elevator pitch. To me, a USP is the very unique thing that sets you apart. It might be like, hey, I, I sell houses for 5% more than anyone else can, or I guarantee you this. Your elevator pitch is similar to the, I have a team, and you probably want to include two to four points in there of, thing, of categories that you help. So I have a team, and we help with this and this. That's your elevator pitch or your USP, whatever you want to call it. Thank you so much. All right. Appreciate All right. Thank you. Two more in the queue, guys. We're going to go a little bit over, but we are going to get to everyone. Second to last this week is phone number ending at 8270. You're up next. Hi, good morning. My name is Jade Newman. Hi, good morning. Thank you for receiving my call. I actually joined. I'm not a, a client yet. I'm really interested in learning about all the leads. I learned about ATL through Tim and Julie Harris coaching. And so yep. i joining to learn more about your system and see how it works. And I'm very excited to, I'm very excited to, you know, to learn more about it. And I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity because so far so good. And I'm thinking that I will likely become part of the system later this month or early February. Awesome. I have a feeling one of our salespeople may just call you back shortly to make sure you understand everything, if that's okay. I need to learn more about it, do my due diligence, and make sure that I, when I do something, I'm going to be doing 121%. I love your attitude, Jay. Thanks for sharing. Appreciate it. All right. Last up, I didn't, Salvatore, Mr. Salvatore, I saved you for last because I know Sometimes we get in, de in in depth with you. What can we do for you, sir? Sounds good. I'll actually keep it really short because I, I know we're going over. The stranger of the questions, when we have leads, do we I, – I know that usually the leads, like the, the personal representatives or the, the estate, usually tends to have a single-family residence. Is there by any chance – are probates – can they often be multifamily as well? And when I say multifamily, large assets such as maybe 10 units and above? 100%. No, we, I always got, I've had many commercial brokers that ask, is this any good for commercial real estate? And I, or what percentage of the probates have commercial real estate? And I always go hit, hit the question back to them, what percent of Americans own commercial real estate? It's probably maybe 2% and maybe 5% yeah. of Americans own, 5 to 10% own, probably more like 5% if I had to guess, own multiple units. Yeah. But yeah, but yeah. there's absolutely that potential. There's no special exclusion yeah. for commercial property. And you would think that, that don't make the mistake of thinking we always tell people, don't think just because somebody is wealthy or has significant assets that they, Walt Disney and Stephen Jobs, all their properties had to go through probate. They were pretty pretty smart people. Just because you own a lot of units doesn't necessarily mean that you set up your estate to avoid probate. They, they, they still get you still will see them in a given set of leads, depending how many leads you're getting. You may only see a few of them per year. It's not going to be multiple every month, or it's not likely to be. Make sense? Okay. Yeah. The, yeah. The, mainly the reason why I was asking is I have a client at the moment who's looking for uh, multi-unit investments in Los Angeles. I actually have two. They're looking up sure. to essentially 100 units, both of them, in uh, prime A-plus type buildings. And I noticed that in the commercial world, at least in Los Angeles, commercial brokers have a tendency of kind of keeping that information to themselves to often try to double end the deal. So I was just trying to sure. find a creative alternative to obtain access to these dwellings. I had an idea while you were asking that question, and I'll run it by Bruce, but what if you were to go back in Los Angeles? I think we get 450 leads a month. If you yeah. went back, if you went back maybe six months or a year, maybe we could give you some kind of a volume pricing. But what if you took the last three to six months worth and ran them through Probate Plus? At least you'd be able to see which ones did have multiple units, and you could you wouldn't waste a, a lot of time and effort on marketing on ones that don't. Would you think that would make sense, Bruce? I think I think it makes perfect sense. This is my input on this is gonna going to be good just real estate advice if you're pursuing business anyway. Whenever I 
and pursuing a particular uh, person, be it a, a, a homeowner, someone in my sphere of influence, or a an estate planning attorney. I'm usually going to make try to make my request, if I'm asking for a, a referral, I'm going to try to make my request very sticky. Okay, in other words, if you go to an estate planning attorney and say, hey, could you send me everybody that you have that has real estate? That's a, a very broad brush. You're painting a broad picture, and they're likely going to forget that because they've heard that from other agents and investors before. But if you go to that same person and you say, hey, I specifically have investors who are looking for multifamily properties, 10 units or above. We don't want to get too crazy specific, but 10 units or above. And a lot of those don't go through probate. If you run into those, I have your buyer. And that's really sticky for them because they remember it. And not many people have asked yeah. for something like that. Same thing applies with your other I don't want to camp out on this, but the same thing applies with your sphere of influence if you're in real estate. Instead of saying, by the way, if you know anyone looking to buy or sell real estate, would you refer me? You say, I have a buyer looking for a four-bedroom colonial brick house in such and such a neighborhood, and I can't find it. Do you know anyone? They're going to remember that request much more than a, oh, by the way, type of conversation. So, Fed, with, in you, with your specific um, question, I would go to estate planning attorneys and use the two relationships you have with people that are looking for big complexes, and I would ask specifically for that. It's going to make you memorable, and it, it's not going to eliminate the other types of referrals that they would send you. It's just going to make you more memorable. I love that. I'm actually – I'm going to take the second suggestion as well for the – not you know, instead of saying, oh, by the way, do you know anyone looking to buy or sell? I like – the alternative you have to that. So that absolute gold, as always, thank you guys so much. Thank Thanks, you, guys. sir, guys. It is so good to be back, guys. Great first call of the year. Great call, as always, and you guys are the call. You're the reason that this works so well, and you guys always show up. You always participate. You have great questions. I want to thank each and every one of you for being here today. I want to particularly thank those that actively participated, and I want to challenge each of you. Take one thing that you heard on today's call that inspired you. Go out and put it into practice, and please come back next Wednesday. We will have the role play call for sure, and then come back next Thursday and share your results with the group. Stay safe. Stay productive. Make it a great week, and we will talk to you next week. Take care, everybody.